like to start, I think, with two things. First of all, I come from, you can tell from the accent, a northern town. I'm red brick, middle terrace, come from the Lancashire side of things. And I've got to say to you, if you said to me, what's landscape? I'd say, I've got the foggiest idea. If you said to me, what's a national park? I would have said, I've no idea. I would say, has it got something to do with Scottish country? To most people in this country, you speak a language they don't understand. And the European Landscape Convention didn't help. Because actually it said a tree is landscape as well as the Yorkshire Dales. That's not helpful when you don't know what you're talking about in the first place. So language is incredibly important. And it's one of the challenges I found over the years when actually what makes a difference is how you react on the street to the way that you live your life. The other thing that I just want to say before I show you lots and lots of pictures, which is great, it, well I hope it's great, um, is I want to reference the point that Jonathan made around the um, Real World Summit. Because I've done lots of things in my life around people. I've done politics, I've chaired meet, you know, lots of organisations at every level, I've done economics, I've done health, I've done community, I've done a lot. But at the heart of all that has been this thinking around what do we mean in order to live a kinder world for our children. And when there was the Real World Summit, I thought, way fantastic, we're going to get somewhere, we're all going to sign up to doing it, and we'll... whatever it might be. Somebody somewhere out there, who's cleverer than us, will work out what technologies or policies or change of budgets or whatever, and it's going to be all right. Well, it most definitely is not all right, 20 odd years on. And it was that realisation and frustration and anger that nothing was being done for my family, my neighbours, the people I knew, the poorest people in the world, people whose children I'd never meet. That nothing at all was being done, that I ended up thinking, okay, Instead of whinging and having a wet towel on my head about the state of the planet, why don't I see if I can just do something myself and demonstrate that in each and every one of us is a solution for change. And that's why this girl who came from Red Brick Terrace, who doesn't understand, well, I do know, but who didn't understand the word landscape, who was totally confused at the lack of action by the people who should be doing good things for us, came to invent this thing called Incredible Edible. And the whole point of Incredible Edible, small, minute, though it might be, it allows each and every one of us, whatever our age, income, ability or culture, to see that we ourselves have got the means to shift the way we live our lives. And through that collectively, with our neighbours, the way we live in the communities in which we live. And through that, have a greater understanding that we can redefine prosperity, that we can live happy, healthy lives without being dominated by the fiscal cliff and the growth agenda. And that actually, at the end of the day, all those collective actions of ordinary people can actually move mountains, because people are magnificent and we forget it. We spend too much time worrying about the people who are not doing things and not enough time looking at the people who are doing things. We talk about the negative and not the positive. If we're ever going to do anything collectively, as professionals or just mums and dads, we have to believe we have something positive that we can offer in order to deliver this sustainable future, whatever that might be, in the landscape of our lives, wherever that might be. And so Incredible Edible is a really simple proposition. It's incredibly simple because it's got to be simple because basically professionals have overcomplicated this entire thing with respect. It's about... Finding a common language that can engage people, that can allow them to do things themselves without asking anybody's permission, that in some way influences the spaces around them, the relationship they have with their community, their aspirations and their self-belief. That's what it is. And I come from a really simple proposition that says, if you can help enough people really believe in their own ability to change their future, they can actually drive change. And I speak as an ex-politician, and I've got to tell you, there is very little bottle in politics. There ain't many people who will stand up and be counted to do something that really matters in this world. But if enough people tell them to do it, from the street upwards, they will shift their minds. They will shift their planning. They will shift their policies. They will bend budgets. And that's the way it works. And it doesn't work in year one. It doesn't work in year two. It doesn't work in year three. But you keep at it, and it will change the way that we live within our society. 
So the language I use is food. It's a unifying language. It's, you know, you can take incredible edible, I say food growing scheme, and many people have. Or you can actually take it as the door of opportunity to help every single person, wherever they live, on whatever street, in whatever state, to realise that they are way ahead of the politicians in terms of what's needed. And that each and every one of them wants to do the right thing for their children. They just don't necessarily know how to do it. So it's fantastic to be able to work with you guys about, not the big picture stuff, because I can't do that big picture stuff, but to say on the street, in the backyard, at the doctors, at the railway station, we, in the public realm of our lives, have the right to do what we want in that public realm if it makes our world a kinder, gentler, more secure place, because it's called public realm. We have the right to challenge the people who tell us how we live our lives, to stop being victims, and to start putting forward propositions collectively. We have the right to start to think and talk to the housing associations who manage the houses in which we live, and start to ask for the right to have spaces in which to grow good quality food for our children. Or whatever it might be, that we collectively, in our communities, have decided is needed. Now, the interesting proposition about this is it isn't E equals MC squared, and people love to have an equation. You know, the reason the world isn't kind of like uh, in a different stage is because we haven't quite found, you know, enough money to make it so, or a special formula in our... No, no, no. The reason the world is in the state is it because we didn't have the will to do anything different. That's it. So I'm trying to go back to grassroots and in a really, really small way, with a really little piece of the equation, say, actually, with the will to be different, to challenge values, to think about ethics, and all that underpins the decisions in our everyday life. Collectively, we have seen, with what we've done in Todmorden and the other towns across the UK and the other communities around the world, individuals waking up, scales falling from their eyes and saying... This is my world and I want it to be different and I'm going to do something. And those people may just be ordinary girls, but some of those people are in positions of influence and suddenly start to see that they themselves can start to pull levers of change. And then collectively, serendipity comes on board and all manner of things happen. And I've spent the last seven years doing this and I'm going to spend the rest of my life doing it because to do little actions one step at a time and to persuade professionals to think it's all too complicated for ordinary people to be involved in it. And those sophisticated arguments that want to disenfranchise us. To actually achieve the sort of discussions that I'd like to have in this country and beyond takes a long time. Because change takes a long time. But it is changing, and it's fantastic. I just want to start at the beginning. That's the landscape of Tobinum if I knew in the old days what the landscape of Todmorden looked like. And what I'm trying to do with this really small proposition is to bring that landscape back into the relevance of the footfall on the street. I'm trying to do that. You don't have to necessarily wear a silly hat to do this, but basically, the people of Todmorden came together and drew their landscape and funded that themselves and stuck it up on the railway station without anybody's permission in order to say, this is our incredible town. We are proud of it. It took seven years to get that done, but we've got it done. And it was ordinary folks that backed it. And the interesting thing about that is, did the railway station object? No. Did the police ever object to anything? No. Does health ever object? No. Do politicians object? No. Why? Because they can hear the truth from the people who really care, who believe they have the right to have an opinion. So let me just tell you really quickly through Incredible Edible Todman and what that's all about. And a lot of you may have heard of it, some of you may not. It works on a principle. Put food at the centre of community, learning and business. Spin the three plates together. Don't overcomplicate it. See if you can bring about change. See if you can redefine prosperity. See if you can regenerate without huge growth budgets. This is Todman. And it used to look like that. It's really challenged. It's got a lot of hills around that don't, don't grow very much more than sheep. It's got unemployment rates, it's got, you know, failing schools, it's got all the issues that a northern market town has got. But now it's starting to look more like this, which has got fruit and veg and herbs springing up all over the place. People in the town, not asking permission to do it, just doing it. Because they want to take back the spaces of their lives in the most demonstrable way they can. 
and in this particular instance, taking over the wharf by the canal and planting sweet palm, which of course is not indigenous to Tobinan, but hey, it looks kind of cute. And doing it there, and doing it in front of the police station, and doing it all over town, and redefining what they want in the public realm, and giving a great buzz out of it, and giving it as a gift, having asked nobody for any money in order to do it, but just to say, we want to redefine what our town looks like, we want to redefine the landscapes of our lives, we will call them edible landscapes, and we will put them all over the place. So, without asking anybody's permission again, because why ask for permission when it's your gift to try and make the landscapes of your life kinder and more lovely and more functional, we take over the canal banks and we make edible towpaths. We grow fennel and we grow apricots, believe it or not, in sunny spots. We grow a lot of soft fruits. We grow all manner of things. Don't bother asking permission half the time. I know you guys have to ask permission. But the difficulty is that if you're going to ask permission and you have a sense that somebody's going to say no, then don't bother asking them in the first place. Just do it. <laughs> and the interesting thing about that is because people come together collectively with their skills around growing, all their skills around design, or just their passion to do something that's different, what happens is you get wonderful things. You get young people volunteering to make the most beautiful raised beds. You get older people coming and reminding themselves of what it was during the allotment times of the war and contributing their skills collectively. You get the town coming together to reshape its public spaces. And then, of course, you get the Canals and Rivers Trust and what was then the British Waterways coming along and saying how fantastic it was and wouldn't it be great if everybody did the same thing. So, ultimately, if people give of themselves and their own resources and their own passion in redefining the landscapes of their lives, nobody's going to stop them doing it. And the great thing that happens as you continue to do that is you take a space like this, which used to have a hoarding all the way around it, because that's what local government does when it drops a building right in the centre of the town, right at the start of a recession, right next to the market hall. You take down the hoarding, you get young people to start to do something about it, and within a very short space of time, you've redefined the centre of the town. Now, you've got to finesse people a little bit. I'm not making that noise. I don't think I'm making that noise. But anyway, if I am, I apologise. But basically, we took over the centre of that town. We renamed it Pollination Street. That actually doesn't exist. That's just a, a prop. Um, and that um, hive isn't a real hive. It's a pretend hive. But it starts to help people think how they are looking at the map of their town, which was a hoarding with a lot of bricks in the middle of it, and now it's a green space, and they're enjoying it. And you know the great thing about that? The people of the town did that. The local authority then came along and put picnic benches there, and now people have their lunch there, having bought the stuff from the market hall, and sit there in the middle of the town, feeling happy about themselves. And they're all whipping up a great sense of joy, because they want that space now to be preserved against development, because it's redefined the heart of the town. And it was just an experiment, but it was about the people taking back the spaces of their lives. And this is another one. This is the local college beds. We did ask permission on this case, and we took up some roses, which didn't make people very happy, but nevertheless we did. And a lot of people took a lot of time building raised beds and growing things, because every single propaganda bed in the middle of town is there to talk about, to show people, and to share food from. That's the point of the propaganda beds, to get a conversation growing about the spaces of your lives. And now it looks like that. And it's been adopted by the Scouts, and some children's services have adopted it, and now some Asian ladies are growing their coriander in there. All because they can. Right at the heart of the town. Not on the edge of the town. Not where they've been told food grows, but right at the very heart of it. Redefining what a plan looks like. What a town looks like. And what we're going to do from that is have a neighbourhood plan based entirely around the proposition that local food is at the heart of it. What's the town going to look like? Where are you going to build the processing units? Where are you going to put your polytunnels? Where are you going to channel for local authority about what it says you can and you can't do? All because the town of Tottenham said it was going to do it. And these are just ordinary people. The health centre. The most mindless thing of all is when you create health centres and then you landscape them with prickly plants that are totally inedible. And then you run a multi-million pound campaign nationally about each five a day. Now somebody somewhere must be thinking in this kind of like design centre, well, wouldn't it make more sense if we planted apple trees and strawberries and raspberries and herbs and God knows what else? Well, I think that's a good idea. So we went to the doctors and we took up all the prickly plants and we used our own funds and we planted edible landscapes. And now around a lot of health centres all over the place, people are starting to plant edible landscapes. Just because it makes sense to have that sort of food 
where sick children can actually taste what a raspberry look like when they walk to the doctors instead of thinking they're going to be dominated by coffee pills. And the same for the job centre. It used to look like that at the top right hand corner. I mean, how depressing. You've not got a job, you're absolutely, you know, skint, and you've got to walk across a bit of time like that. So basically, we took over the front of that, and now we grow vegetables, and people that are going there, have a, they might just imagine a different future, a different skill set. See the back streets verdant with whatever vegetables or fruits they themselves want to grow. That would happen at every job centre in the country. It just changes people's perceptions about the place that they live. And when you change the perceptions about the place that you live, you start to feel different about yourself. You start to feel different about yourself, you start to make different decisions. You start to recognise that perhaps the way you were living your life is not in the best interest of your children. And suddenly that slow wheel of thinking about the reconnection to environment and sustainability in space starts to reconnect. And all you've done is have an experiment of planting food. And one of the things that happened is that the, the, the uh, shops in the middle of town now have taken to creating their own ba raised beds on the pavement. And no, they haven't asked the planning commission if they're actually going to do it. But they're there. And they're there to share. And now we've got several shops along the routes in the middle of town that are planting edibles, redefining public spaces to be edible public spaces. And I'm delighted to say we didn't have anything to do with this, but because of the work that we've been doing all over the country, we've 30 odd, 40 towns that are already doing incredible edible, and we've got communities that talk to each other all over the world, in America, in Africa, all over the place. We've got cities like Leeds that are redefining their public realm right by City Hall as edible. And that has been done by many of the tenants from some of the poorer communities. So everybody has an easy way, a low cost budget way of thinking about reconnecting with the environment. But it's not all about the centre of town. So we got a little bit of muddy land on the edge of town that was given us by a garden centre who didn't really want it. And it was kind of like overrun by rabbits. So we managed to get some funding and we put that cold it like fence around it. And purely with the skills of the volunteers and the passion of the local community, we've turned it into that, which is the market garden training centre. We have got planning permission for that. We were well on the way before we actually put into it, but never mind. But we've got lots of community beds and we've got lots of community action and we've got lots of food growing. We've got young people coming through the school with a bee taken agriculture because the community wanted it, who can imagine they're the farmers of the future, but who want to actually farm in a way that they know what goes into the soil because they care about how they feed their family. So we're bringing back the economy and we're bringing back the actions and we're bringing back the decision making to a local level. Because then you've got a closed loop system. Because if you're going to do something a bit dodgy on the financial, it's going to have a neg negative impact on the social and on the environmental. If you're at a local level, you stand the cat's chance, you cat in health chance of stopping it because it doesn't make any sense. So this is all about starting with food, redefining prosperity, rethinking local economies, rethinking local politics, getting people's minds in such a state that they understand their personal responsibility for the environment around them. And the same in the South Pennines, which is a landscape I care passionately about, where Eat the View is very much still on the agenda. Where people are starting to recognise that local food and where you actually you know, have your energy and whatever else it might be, can be defined by the pound in your pocket and by your own personal decisions. And ultimately, by taking back personal responsibility, and I'm nearly there, and by saying it's about actions, not words, and not waiting for somebody else to find your solution. You start to understand how important it is that you respect the children of all species. How important it is you start to respect the type of food you're eating, the, where, the places that it's growing in, the investments you want to see your politicians putting money into. You could make a choice. You may want to carry on dry stone walling. You could make a choice. You may take a view on ballots that actually this is what you want on your landscape in the second hand. You may just want to have loads of adrenaline gateways all over the place. Whatever it might be, but suddenly you start to realise the decision is yours, not somebody else's. You can't cast the book on sustainability. The decision is yours. And ultimately, when we're having a debate in the South Pennines, in Todmorden, or wherever it might be, we ourselves understand that we need to get the information that allows us to have the view about where the water is, where the energy is, where the food is grown, where we want developments to take place. And at the moment, we are pawns in somebody else's game. And it's about time we stop that. And I think people in your profession are absolutely at the forefront of that conversation. And that's why I was delighted to come today. Because how you green your cities, how you design, how you think about all the services and functionality, is what you do. And you've all been far too modest in the past, and you need to stand up and shout about it a lot more. 
because the powers that be don't know how to do it. And you've got some great ideas.